building. That was not done without excitement, controversy, disagreement, and humor, as Mr. Upsall can easily recall. Mr. Mr. Upsall? everybody. I'm happy to have a part in this centennial program of our Farmers Union. You know, I feel somewhat at home up here on this platform as I've served you people 11 years as your state president. And you're the greatest group of people that I ever become acquainted with. And you're doing a grand job. Keep it up. Don't expect me to make a speech here tonight because, you know, you kind of run out of practice when you retire as a state president. You don't make so many speeches anymore. And your voice gets kind of rusty, too. So I'm just going to tell you about some of the highlights and some of the events that took place during my administration. One of the highlights was the building of your new Farmers Union office on Highway 37, down southern part of your town here. It took two state conventions in Mitchell to make or to have the Farmers Union membership agree that Huron would be more centrally located for our state office. It took two state conventions to get the farmers agreed to that. So immediately, uh, then they had agreed upon where to build. It was up to find, for us to find a location and a piece of land to build. We were quite fortunate in finding these four or five blocks here facing Highway 37, which I feel, and you feel also, was a very good place to locate our state headquarters. But we immediately run into opposition when, we, when they heard that the Farmers Union was going to build a state office there with the zoning committee because that happened to be in a residential area. That's what they told us. And they didn't want the Farmers Union to bring in a bunch of old tractors and a bunch of old machinery and start peddling around in their residential area. So we had to meet several times with the zoning committee here in Huron to convince them that we were not that kind of an organization, that we were an educational organization, promoting cooperatives, promoting understanding and goodwill among the farmers and the people of South Dakota. Well, we finally won on that fight, too. So when you propose something new in the Farmers Union, you're always going to find some opposition. And you've got to have a conviction or a strong conviction that we shall overcome those things that oppose us. So we got busy and started building. And you know, we had two dedicatory services at the Farmers Union building. You older members remember all of those things. You young people don't, I'm sure because you still wasn't active in the Farmers Union at those day, in those days. We had two dedicatory services there for the laying of the cornerstone. And when the building was completed, we had a dedication service for the completed building. And we had both Governor Anderson and Governor, uh, what's his name, uh, Nicholson, 
take part in those dedicatorial services. And you know, <clears throat> we got rather friendly with uh, the governors. I had uh, Mikkelsen attend our convention programs, and Sigurd Anderson attended many of our state conventions. And you know, Mikkelsen was, uh, he, he was quite distant from us, but he become very friendly. I had him on the platform, and when we're handing out, you know, a little gift to the people who were prompt to come back after dinner, you know, we always had a little something to hand to them as a present. So I got Governor Mickelson up there, and I said, Governor, will you pass out these presents to the people who are come right on date to attend uh, their session in the State Farmers Union? Yeah, he come up and done it. And after he got through, he said, you're a great organization to build friendship and influence people. I thought that was a pretty good compliment for us. So that's uh, some of the things. And when the building was completed, the counties wanted to have a part, a little bigger part, so they agreed to plant a tree to beautify the lawn surrounding your state office. And as those trees and bushes grew, we were in hopes that the county organization would grow with those trees. And I thought that was a pretty good idea and the membership just done a wonderful job and planted a lot of nice trees, which you people can enjoy now and we hope for many years to come. Well, you know, <clears throat> we were enjoying tax exemption on the part of the building that the educational organization was housed. We didn't question the insurance part of the building that we were subject to tax. So the assessor would come around every spring and wanted to assess us. No, I said, you go upstairs. And I says, assess all you want. Put it on the books. But don't try to, to assess us down here in the educational building because we have tax exemption. Well, the pressure got so great that our good friend, John Fosheim, who was then attorney here in Beetle County. Paul, he said, we better go to court on this and have this cleared up. So he suggested that we go to George Norbeck's office or the courthouse in Redfield where Governor Mickelson was judge. So I loaded our good friend, John Fulsheim, and our secretary, uh, Gene Olson, our articles and bylaws, and went to Huron. And we had quite a discussion. But after it was all over with, Judge Norbeck said, I declare, and I'm convinced, that the educational part of the building of the Farmers Union is tax and exempt from taxation. After which I thanked the judge and took our attorney and John Fosham and the rest of the group and bought them lunch. It was a very friendly hearing and that's still going on. Well now, <clears throat> As I said, when you start something new in the Farmers Union, you probably have, you still have some objections. When we tried to start the insurance program here in South Dakota, we had quite a job getting that job done because we had an unfriendly insurance commissioner appear that wouldn't grant the State Farmers Union license to write insurance. Because he said they're a radical organization, 
there are people that isn't qualified to write insurance and so forth and so on. Many excuses. Well, we got fed up with that kind of a story. So the board of directors directed me to go down and talk to the governor, Governor Mickelson. Well, I was happy to do it. So I went to Peter and visited with the governor. Now I said, Governor, I think we're worthy. We're worth it. We've got the assets. We've got the necessary people that are pretty smart in many businesses, and I know that they can write insurance. Well, after considerable argument, the governor took the phone and he called the insurance commissioner. He said, Grant the South Dakota Farmers Union license to write their insurance in South Dakota. Another victory for the Farmers Union, another service that's set up for the membership that will be benefit to them. And in connection with <coughs> this insurance or this uh, insurance business, you have to have membership in the Farmers Union before you qualify for many of our insurances that we write. And the earnings from the insurances will eventually self sit back to our state organization. That was one of the requirements of the state union. Our insurance baby didn't have enough money to get started, you know. So we were fortunate in having some extra money in the educational organization. So we immediately gave our insurance set up a loan so they could start operating. And another highlight that uh, I shall never forget and that is when we bought our first bus. I think we were the second state in South Dakota to have a farmer's union bus. And you know, it took a little debating and questions whether our organization could afford a bus. But GT and Senex said, we'll let you have the money if you find a bus. Well, that didn't take long to find a bus. And we got the money from them to buy the bus with the understanding that we was to repay it with a very minimum rate of interest. And they worked out another deal for us that was very good. They said, we'll give you $5 for every member you bring down here to visit the regional cooperatives, and that'll help you pay for the bus. So I said, good, fine. And you know, we hold a lot of you good people, you older members, down to visit your great regional cooperatives in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And you know, <clears throat> it took quite a lot of money to, to buy that great big nice bus, 27 past year. So we figured out another way we could probably help pay for it. We made out some stock. Stock number one was common stock. That was voting stock. Preferred stock was a little bit higher. Common stock was $5, preferred stock was 10 and the guilt age stock was $25. So we raised quite a lot of money to apply on the bus. But there was something about this bus deal that I'll never forget. I was delegated to go to St. Paul to sign up the papers at the GTA office for the indebtedness and the money advanced to us. 
I was happy to do that. And when it was time to go home, I, one of the employees, Gordy Rock, was supposed to drive the bus to Mitchell and take me back down there to headquarters. <clears throat> so I got comfortably settled in the bus, and lo and behold, we got out of city limits, and Gordy drove the bus up to the edge of the highway and said, Paul, here she is, take it over. Now I said, look, I've never driven a bus. I said, I don't know the first thing about it. Oh, he said, it's simple, just like driving your car, not in tow. Just see that you got gas in the tank. Well, I had no choice. So I crawled in the driver's seat and started down the road. I've got a secret I can tell you now. I didn't find the high gear in that bus until I got it halfway to Mitchell. It had seven gears forward. And you know, I had a straw hat on, of course, in the summertime. And I'd meet bus drivers along the highway. They'd highball me, you know. And I'd highball them back. And I bet they thought, who is that screwball that's driving a bus with a straw hat on? <laughs> well, you know, <clears throat> I enjoyed that very much because that bus has been a great thing for us people in the Farmers Union to see America and many foreign countries like up in Canada and Mexico, many of the people would never have been able or privilege to make those tours if it wasn't for the generosity of the Farmers Union to furnish them the vehicle to travel in. And it's been a membership builder and a membership stabilizer and has been very helpful in building our Farmers Union. Another venture that I believe is doing a lot of good, and that is that you're carrying on the farm labor conferences every year. That was organized in your auditorium in your state office building here. And I know that Ben and the labor people will carry on that program because it's important that farmers and laborers work together. And if you get that force working together, you can accomplish things. Well, <clears throat> that's some of the uh, highlights in my administration. And let me have a word with the young people here tonight who are about to re receive your torchbearer's pin. Now, we want you to wear that with pride because it's the highest recognition that your Farmers Union can bestow on our young people. And to those of you who have received the Farmers Union torchbearer's pin, make use of it. Feel proud to wear it because what that stands for is to be proud of your farmers' union and the organization you belong to and help to build it. And when us older people lay down our torch, I hope you young people will be ready to pick it up and carry on. So again, at this bicentennial year and this state convention, I appreciate greatly to appear before many of you good people. As I look into your faces, I know that many are missing here tonight, and that's the way life is. We're here one day, and the next day we're gone. But if we do something good for the people we remain behind, 
It will be a great satisfaction to those who leave behind. Thank you very much. Paul Upsall, probably, he probably didn't know, and probably, or probably didn't remember. You know, when we built the state office, there was something that had taken place ahead of time. And I can remember just as though it happened today. When Paul Erickson and myself walked down to the bank with 75000 and I think that's the correct figure, with $75,000 and deposited it to be used to build a state office. And that is the beginning of this beautiful office that we have here now. But that wasn't what I was supposed to talk on tonight. I was supposed to mention something about the checkoff system in cooperatives. And there was a time when we didn't have a cooperative or at least a cooperative oil company in our county. We had tried a few times to build cooperative institutions, elevators and so on. Some of them fell by the wayside and some of them weren't doing so hot. But we went out and organized and sold stock in the Farmers Union Oil Company at Toronto or Dual County, of which I am still a member, and which I am very proud to look at the figures that you have out in your office. We have over a thousand members, a thousand Farmers Union members in our county. And I think that the cooperative, the Farmers Union Oil Company at Toronto is one of the largest, if not the largest in the state. There was a time when we didn't have a central exchange in South Dakota, when we didn't have the GTA. There was a time when we didn't have the Farmers Union. And I was just one of these young fellows about the age of some of these folks that are on your program tonight when I went out to organize the first Farmers Union. It was in the 30s. Prices were way down. And I had to go out and talk to farmers who had nothing in their pockets but hands and try to build a farm organization and a cooperative. And I found out through actual experience, a little later on, you know, uh, our trouble was we didn't have anybody to go out and organize. That's why I went. Somebody had to do it, and if nobody else went, John had to do it. And after we had our co-op and our farmers union set up in Duell County, it wasn't long before I was in other places in the state. And one place where I learned this lesson was west of the river. I got caught in a, a, a rainstorm. And if any of you have ever driven in Gumbo, you know what my problem was. First thing I knew, I was in the ditch. But that it wasn't bad. Right alongside of me on a hillside were a thousand horses, each one powerful and strong. But they didn't do me any good. So here come a farmer along with two old plugs hooked onto the car and pulled me out. There I learned something about working together. Two horses working together, and some of you don't know what it is to drive a horse, but some of our older folks know it. We got two of them working together, could do more than a thousand individuals up there on the hillside. So we went out and organized and built farmers' union and built cooperatives. I can remember one Sunday afternoon, a beautiful Sunday afternoon, just like we had here this afternoon. I spoke at a picnic down in Lenox, South Dakota. And after the program was over and the baseball game started, Four or five men came up and wanted to talk to me. So we sat down. And before the afternoon was over, we had organized the Farmers Union Oil Company at Lenox, South Dakota. But we didn't have the Farmers Union checkoff. And it wasn't long before our cooperative wholesale wasn't supplying them their requirements. We didn't have the central exchange here yet and other cooperative wholesale got their business. So we found out that we had to build the Farmers Union membership, 
we had to have that check off and we had to have the two working together. So by putting the check off in, as we did in dual county, we can wind up here tonight with the largest membership in the state of South Dakota of any county, or we can have one of the largest cooperative oil companies in the state, the Dual County Farmers Union Oil Company of Toronto. And, and so by working together, buying together, and selling together, we have something to turn over to these youngsters after all, they are the ones that we are building for. And by the way, that's about all the time I have, but I want to wind up with a poem that we used to use as we were out building these cooperatives. It's a uh, poem called The Bridge Builder by Drum Gul. An old man, something like me, <coughs> going a lone highway, came in the evening, cold and gray to a chasm, vast and deep and wide, through which there flowed a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream held no fear for him. But he paused, went safe on the other side, and built a bridge to span the tide. Good friend, said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again will pass this way. You crossed the chasm, deep and wide, Why built you this bridge at eventide. The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I have come, he said, that followeth after me today, a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm that has been nothing to me could for that fair-haired youth a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim, good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. Thank you, folks. Educational and cooperative. I'm glad they put educational first. I think that comes first. When we first started the Farmers Union, we didn't have a junior educational program. So us fellows, we came in through the disaster route. We came in because of hard times, the 30s. And those are hard to forget. I've been invited to speak at the university to their senior classes to tell about the, the story of the 30s. And uh, that's interesting. That's something that's lost to this generation. But right over here to my right, we have the greatest resource in America. We have co-ops with a million dollar balance sheet, but this is the important thing because the youth are the future of the farmers union. Of course, I'm happy that we built cooperatives because they undergird the farmers union today. At least the farmers union cooperatives like John Scoggy has told you about. His county today, I suppose, has double the membership of any county in the state, and it's not a big county because they set up a cooperative and put the check-off system in there. Now, uh, I was listening tonight to the great speech by the Lieutenant Governor over there at the Young Farmers Banquet. That was a masterpiece. I would like to have a copy of it. He, he said much of the things that I was going to say that helps me out tonight. But the, the bicentennial program, too, is interesting tonight. You know, in the beginning, I'll just make this comparison. 95%, does this come out all right? Or 95% of our population were farmers. George Washington was a farmer. And, and uh, the farmers were the ones who fought the battles of Lexington, Concord, and Bunker Hill, Saratoga, and Yorktown. The farmers were the ones that achieved liberty and freedom in the Revolutionary War. Now times have come along and changed quite a bit. It's reversed. Today, only 5% are on the farm and 95% are in the cities. And the farmers are doing such a darn good job. They're feeding the 95% so they can spend their time manufacturing the comforts and necessities of life that we all make for a better living standard. 
And uh, that's all I'm going to say about the, uh, the bicentennial. Now, uh, we have real challenges ahead of us. We have organized farmers union. The farmers union has great concerns. They're not only concerned about their immediate problems, they're concerned about our economy. They're concerned about the nation. And they are concerned about the world. And I was glad to hear Tony, or uh, not Tony, I'm thinking about Lieutenant Governor Woolman tonight, talk about food. Uh, somebody said I had attended uh, two uh, IFAP, that's International Federation Conferences of the World, Farmers of the World, one in Stockholm, Sweden, and one in Mexico City. And there we discussed the problems of agriculture in the world, distribution, feeding the hungry. We have a, 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 a food and agriculture organization associated with it that met in Iowa this summer, I think the last of June, first of July. And they passed resolutions and took actions. They believe we should have a great international reserve so that when they have starvation in India or Pakistan or some other place, we can move in and help them out or like Guatemala and Central America. You can be proud of the United States of America. They have done more than any nation in all the history of the world to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, to heed the biblical admonition, to minister unto those in distress. We can be proud of that, but we cannot carry the whole burden. It has to be an international proposition, and that's why we have these conferences. I'm glad that uh, throughout the conference here we heard about world hunger. And uh, Lieutenant Governor Wal Wallman said there were so many billion people in the world. Right now, four billion. 1950, there were two and a half. And 1940, there were two. 25 years from now, maybe to turn of the century, we will have six billion people in the world. What are we going to do to meet that situation? Are we going to be able to feed them or are we going to have mass starvation? South Dakota has had a little touch of crop failure and it's pretty darn serious. Makes me think of the 1933. I lived through that and that's what I've been asked to talk on at the university. So, uh, and uh, we don't know what next year has in store but we should make preparations for the future. And I believe in these international reserves. We must continue. But I don't think we should just say we gotta continue into eternity to subsidize. Lieutenant Governor Roman told you tonight something about the Green Revolution. I'm gonna tell you some more. I'm going to tell you something more about the Green Revolution and who was the father of the Green Revolution. The father of the Green Revolution was Norman Borlaug. How many of you have ever heard of Norman Borlaug? Gee, I'm surprised. There's quite a few hands here. Norman Borlaug was an Iowa boy. He grew to be a man, he had an Iowa farm, he went to the Minnesota University, he took up forestry and he studied genetics. And somehow he became employed by the Rockefeller Institute down in Mexico City. I was there 26 years ago. I saw what they were doing. They were trying to improve varieties of grain for countries like Mexico. You take your seed down there, that won't hardly grow. You gotta have a seed that's adapted, plants that are adapted to that country. And Norman Borlaug was assigned the job of developing improved varieties of wheat, cross-bred varieties, dwarf wheat. And do you know, after 16 years, Mexico has been a, become an exporting country where they used to have to import wheat. And Norman Borlaug's work extended to India. That's the place we used to have famines where millions died. And he improved the varieties of wheat. He increased the production in India from 12 million bushels to 26 million bushels. That feeds 70 million extra human beings, the efforts of his work. That's what we have to have. We have to teach 
these other countries better methods of fertilizer, improved plant varieties, and uh, so I, I tell you, Norman Borlaug is the only man in agriculture who ever received the Nobel Prize. He journeyed to Stockholm, Sweden. I think Norway is the one that selected him, the parliament, and Sweden paid that Nobel Prize. He's the only man in agriculture. This summer he came, or this spring, he came to Brookings early in March, and I was determined to go and hear him. And uh, the big auditorium was filled. It was a blizzard night. And here comes the president of the university with Norman, and he saw me. I know the president. I knew him before he ever came to Brookings. And, and he saw me. He said, Emil, I want you to come up here and meet Norman Borlaug. I, I said, I'm awful happy to meet you, Norman. I said, uh, there's a Borlaug in this audience. She's my wife. Would you like to meet her? So he came down in the audience and visited with my wife, told all about his relationship. The Borlaugs came from Norway before the Civil War. They settled in Wisconsin. But I want to mention this Borlaug because he has done more than many nations have done to improve the conditions of a hun world hunger. That's the message. Uh, Go Lieutenant Governor mentioned the Green Revolution. Borlaug is the father of the Green Revolution. Well, I was, I'm proud. I am proud of the singing over here. We've listened to the rhythmic symphony of youthful voices and the masterly play of human hands. You know what Martin Luther said? He said, there's nothing comparable to the power of music to raise the human soul above the sordid things of life. Even Darwin, the great atheist, said, if I had life to live over again, I would spend more time listening to good music. And the juniors have given us a treat this evening. They are the future farmers of America. May God keep this nation through the dangers that lie ahead. May the luster of old glory never be sullied or stained by war, injustice. May it never advance save to bring freedom and liberty and self-government to all between, beneath its folds. I thank you. Rapid communication may have redu reduced the size of the world, but food supply is finite and population is not. The challenge of greater cooperation and understanding to reduce the world hunger is invading every acre of our farmland and gnawing at every granary door. Hundreds of millions of men, women, and children whose futures, whose perspectives on life, whose values, and whose capacities to appreciate being alive depend largely on our willingness and ability now to take up the challenges of providing them and helping them to provide themselves with an adequate supply of food. If the challenge is not met, we will not have adequately, adequately provided for our own children's future.
from California to New York Islands, to the Redwood Forest, to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. Freedom isn't free, freedom isn't free. You gotta pay the price, you gotta sacrifice for your liberty. There once was a general by the name of George and a small band of men at Valley Fort for the comfort of home, for the snow and ice. He won independent cause he paid the price. Freedom isn't free, freedom isn't free. You gotta pay the price, you gotta sacrifice for your liberty. Fourth of July. She's my Yankee Doodle sweetheart. Yankee Doodle, do or die. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony. Suck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle dandy. Mind the music and the step and with the girls be handy. Hi, my Yankee Doodle dandy. be here. It's so great to say hello to so many dear friends. It is 10 years since I've been gone, but the 10 years haven't diminished many of the very dear friendships. Nice to see you. I have him here with this, uh, at this convention this year, our junior senator, Senator James Abrask, who's going to speak to you now for about 10 or 12 minutes. Jim, where are you? Thank you very much uh, for your kind welcome and for the uh, nice introduction, Harvey Woolman. I want to uh, first of all say that I've uh, just arrived last night from Washington, D.C., where uh, we've undergone a couple of big scandals out there, the Watergate scandal first, now we're just winding up in the waterbed scandal out there. Now, you know that uh, you know what the uh, explanation for all that is out there. You remember during the Vietnam War when the kids went all around the country and were saying they were shot and make love, not war? The Democrats took them seriously this year. But there is one explanation. There's one explanation of why it was only Democrats that got involved in these sex scandals and not any Republicans. And that is what the Democrats are accused of doing with their secretaries, the Republicans have been doing to the country for about the last eight years. Well, I want to thank the South Dakota Farmers Union for inviting me here to speak at the annual convention and to participate in this panel today. For the long support and the friendship the Farmers Union has given me in my public life has been greatly appreciated. I believe my activities in behalf of agriculture have made that support worthwhile. I want you to know that Tony Deschant and Ben Radcliffe are two of the very best farm leaders that this country has ever seen, and I appreciate the work they've done as well. Now, it's strange for me to appear before this group or any other farm group and know that Earl Butts is not sitting back in Washington thinking up ways to sell out the American farmer to the giant conglomerates that are rapidly dominating our system of agriculture. But I've got a, 
I've got to say <clears throat> that I believe that Earl Butts's ghost is alive and well and living in the White House yet today. And there's one way, we've got an exorcist. We've called in an exorcist. His name is Jimmy Carter. We're going to exorcise that ghost of giant agribusiness from the White House with your help. <clears throat> Now, as you know, I thought that Earl Butt should have been fired a long time ago, not for his statements about blacks and minorities, but for his farm policies, although I'm, uh, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that he had to say what he did, because it did, uh, it stung an awful lot of people in this country of, uh, of the black race who didn't like what he said, but it's strange that nobody heard what he was doing to farmers for all this time. And that's the time that Earl Butts should have been forced to resign. I, in fact, felt that he should not have been appointed in the first place. Now, I want to talk to you this morning about the future, because the farm policy of the, of the team that we've had in the White House is about to come to an end with the election of Jimmy Carter. Now, Carter would be the first farmer elected president since Thomas Jefferson. I'd say that Mr. Jefferson did a good job, in my view, as president, and I think that this particular farmer, Jimmy Carter, will also be one of our great presidents. Now, the past is clear. The present administration has said, hands off, we don't want any government interference at a time when subsidized dairy imports and a flood of beef imports have collapsed the prices that dairymen and stockmen have received. I'd like to make one other comment. We just saw Saturday the President sign an order limiting beef imports to 1.233 billion pounds of meat coming in this country. Now that's uh, done three and a half weeks before election. When we have been pleading for years for the administration to do something about beef imports, and this very token gesture, when last year's imports were 1.09 billion pounds. He set a limit that's even higher than it was last year trying to win electoral votes. Now, in my opinion, all that amounts to is uh, what uh, we call deathbed converts. The trouble is he's trying to get well electorally at his deathbed, at his, at his political deathbed by making this kind of a desperation gesture that is not going to fool anybody in South Dakota, in any of the cattle areas around the country, and I think we've all pretty much seen through that particular move, and it's not going to do much good at all. Now, the administration said hands off, no government interference when they tried to get farm operating loans into farmers' hands early enough so that they could buy seed and fertilizer for spring planting. And they said no government interference and hands off when Congress passed bills to increase price supports in fact, Congress passed three bills, and the White House vetoed each and every one of them. They said, hands off, we don't want any government interference when we went to the Agriculture Department to get drought relief. But it's curious that the administration team has found the time to provide the worst possible kind of government intervention when they've wanted to. Now, they've used government intervention when the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation, a federal agency, decided to suspend sales of crop insurance in South Dakota because of the drought. They used government intervention of the worst kind when Presidents Nixon and Ford hammered grain producers to the ground by hitting them over the head with four embargoes in three years. Four times in three years, the Nixon, Ford, Butts, big business team put a lid on the price that you could get for your grain by slapping on the embargoes. Now they seem to be adept at, ru at ruining agriculture with lids on prices. I think they ought to give some thought to putting a floor under prices so that we won't go broke producing food. <clears throat> now, Jimmy Carter's statement is very clear. He does not intend to ruin farmers with embargoes. In fact, his position is that he will not place an embargo on grain unless there is a food emergency here at home. 
And I think that's something we can all go along with, and I, I commend him for making that statement. I also happen to know Fritz Mondale, the vice presidential candidate, extremely well. He's a friend of mine, and I want to tell you that he's also a friend of yours. And I know that Fritz Mondale would react the same way with respect to embargoes. What we want in this country, in the farm areas, is not any kind of a government handout. We want predictability and we want stability. Nobody wants anything more than a day's pay for a day's work, any farmer that I know. So I'm going to bring my little talk to an end and let the rest of them come up here. And I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator. We're particularly delighted uh, in South Dakota today to have a national person with us. And he's national in the sense that he's chairman of the Carter Mondale Committee for Food and Agriculture, the National Committee. As you know, Secretary Bob Duxbury is the uh, state chairman here in South Dakota of that committee, and I serve on that committee with Bob and, and Ben Radcliffe and, th and two other uh, gentlemen. But uh, we have the national chairman with us today. And I just want to say a couple of things about Bobby Smith. When he came here this morning and visited with us, he said, uh, boy, you sure all talk funny up here. And uh, you have to really concentrate on that. Uh, he's from the Deep South, and uh, it's really English that he speaks. And just be patient with him, and uh, he'll get it out. But it's very, uh, a very beautiful kind of uh, uh, part of the country to listen to people. Uh, they have a very romantic way of using the English language, and I think that'll be a treat for you. Besides that, Bobby Smith has known Jimmy Carter personally for 21 years. And they've been very close friends. When uh, Jimmy Carter was governor of Georgia, he appointed uh, Bobby Smith to the Board of Regents in that state, which is always an indication of the kind of uh, respect that you'd have for another person and another person's judgment. And the reason we should feel close to Bobby Smith is that he's a, a fellow farmer. And he raises cotton, he raises wheat, he has a cow-calf operation down there, and he also owns a cotton gin. And, uh, we don't know much about ginning cotton up here in South Dakota, and I, I hope he doesn't get into that because it doesn't sound very exciting, very frankly. But he's an exciting man, and a lot of people say, where does Jimmy Carter really stand on the agricultural issues? And those of us that have been around this a while know where he stands. And if some of you don't know, uh, Bobby Smith is going to tell you, and if there's some things that he doesn't cover during the question and answer time, you ask him specific questions of what Carter really believes and what he really thinks and what he's really like. And is his heart really with the American farmer or is it somewhere else? You just put it right to him. And Bobby Smith will give you a straight answer. And we welcome you to South Dakota, and it's a pleasure to have you here, sir. It's real good to be in South Dakota. This is not my first visit here, but I don't get here very often. And certainly I'm impressed by your great country and your people. I was talking with Ben Ratcliffe earlier, and he asked me why I became involved in the Carter campaign. And I told him, I said, well, Ben, it's really quite simple. For the first time in 100 years, we have a chance to put a man in the White House that doesn't have an accent. <laughs> No, really, that's not the reason I became involved. It's a great pleasure for this Georgia farmer to appear before a farm organization in the state that has given farmers two of the best friends we've ever had in Washington. Of course, I refer to your native son, Hubert Humphrey, and your senior senator, George McGovern. Those two senators have been mainstays on the Senate Agricultural Committee working along with my own senator, Chairman Herman Talmadge, to try to make some sense out of the farm programs that the current administration has tried to tie up into knots. I want you also to know how impressed I have been with your young and articulate Lieutenant Governor, Harvey Rubin. He has been an outstanding spokesman for agriculture in this part of the country, and I'm proud to learn of his vigorous support 
of Jimmy Carter during this campaign. And there's another part of being here this morning that gives me a special pleasure. Some people might find it strange for a Farm Bureau officer from Georgia to be speaking to a Farmers Union meeting in South Dakota. But I don't find it strange at all. The fact is that the members of the Georgia Farm Bureau Federation have a lot more in common with the members of the South Dakota Farmers Union than you might think. There's been a lot of disagreement in the Farm Bureau of late, and the Georgia Farm Bureau has been going its own way when we think the American Farm Bureau Federation hasn't been looking out for our members. For example, I would suspect that our position on farm price supports is a lot closer to your position than it is to the Farm Bureau in South Dakota. We supported the 1975 Farm Bill even though the American Farm Bureau opposed it. There is one issue on which we've been in strong agreement over the past few years, and he's named Earl Butts. It's an uneasy feeling not to have Butts to kick this morning. <laughs> he's become sort of a comfortable issue for me during the past several months. But while he's been good for Jimmy Carter, he hasn't been much good for family farmers. When you look at it the way I'd have to say, I'm pleased to lose a campaign issue, and I'm glad the president has been able to fulfill one of Jimmy Carter's campaign promises to fire Earl Butts. But the development of the past several days tell a story that runs much deeper than one man, one member of the cabinet, or even one department of our government. The real sadness of this whole affair lies in what it says about the values of this administration, about what has been important to the federal government under Nixon and Ford. And what it says boils down to one word, insensitivity. Earl Butts may have been forced out of office because of a story that demonstrated his own sensitivity to black people. But we should force the whole bunch out of the office because of their insensitivity to all people. Look at the list of insensitivity. Butts alone has managed to alienate just about every group that makes up America. He insults consumers. He ignores people concerned about clean environment. He makes jokes about the population problems of the world. He makes light of the problems of the poor and disadvantaged. But it goes farther than flip remarks or clever jokes. They're completely insensitive to the need for human understanding. They've tried to divide region against region when we need to heal. They've tried to drive a wedge between farmers and workers when we need mutual understanding. They've tried to build walls between consumers and farmers when we need a bridge. They've tried to set dairy farmers against green growers when we need to work together. They're totally insensitive to the problems of farmers and ranchers hit by the worst drought since the 30s. When your senators and congressmen try to get help to provide hay so South Dakota ranchers don't have to sell their foundation herds, they threaten a veto. When your senators and congressmen try to pass an emergency farm bill to increase the target price and the disaster payment along with it, Ford kills it with a veto. That veto cost Midwestern farmers tens of millions of dollars in disaster payments alone. The 1975 Farm Bill would have increased the disaster payment on wheat to a dollar and three cents a bushel. Under the present, hopelessly inadequate target price, the disaster payment for wheat is only 76 cents a bushel. So far, that veto has cost wheat growers more than $23 million in lower disaster payments. And that just counts for winter wheat. The figures haven't been told yet for spring wheat, corn, or other grains. Instead of the sensitive approach, instead of trying to make the disaster protection program work better, this administration has tried to destroy it. First, they try to make it unworkable. They base your projected yields on the past 10 years. Then they deduct for any silage value, and they set your allotment too low 
all to keep down the size of your disaster payments. And then they recommend legislation which would do away with the disaster payment program altogether. And they get that senator from Kansas, that fellow who's now campaigning as a friend of the farmer to introduce their bill. What they want is no more than a crop insurance program. And South Dakota farmers don't need to be told how inadequate the crop insurance program is. But they're just as insensitive to the problems of farmers who were lucky enough to get any wheat crop at all. From the first week of July to the first week of October, the price of wheat dropped a dollar and 20 cents a bushel. A real demonstration of the bust side of a boom and bust agriculture. The wheat growers wrote and asked for an increase in the loan rate, which is now a dollar and a half a bushel. They got a polite no. But the Agricultural Department's letter of rejection tells you a lot about their insensitivity to American farmers. Just let me read you part of the letter. It says, in view of the potential buildup in wheat supplies, they wrote, you should be aware that we're facing a carryover of about a billion bushels at the end of this crop year, the biggest surplus since the 1960s. But they continued like this. We would urge all wheat farmers to carefully study the long and short term supply demand and price outlook for other crops and consider alternatives which might provide them a better profit in their particular farming operation. And I'm not sure what that means to a family with a thousand acres of wheat in Falk County, South Dakota. Maybe the department wants you to grow rice or soybeans. Or maybe they think I should lend you my cotton gin and you can lend me your $40,000 combine for my farm in Georgia. But I'm sure there's one word that describes that attitude, insensitivity. And that's a pretty good word for the attitude of the Department of Agriculture when they hear about misgrading, short weighing, bribing and cheating in grain inspection. As early as 1969, dedicated public servants in the department tried to warn them about the fraudulent grain shipments, but they hushed it up and they continued to look the other way until an aggressive grand jury in New Orleans slapped indictments on more than 75 individuals and big grain companies. But even then, they continued their gross insensitivity to the real needs for reform. They opposed every reform effort in Congress. The strong reforms proposed by senators like Clark, Humphrey, and McGovern. Twice the president himself threatened to veto any bill strong enough to displease his friends in the grain trade. And even in the closing days of Congress, when agreement was near on a compromise, a compromise weak enough that it had Senator Dole's endorsement, Secretary Butts and his hand-picked successor tried to kill even that weak bill. And as long as we're talking about the fellow who is sitting in Earl Butts' chair this morning, let's take a closer look at him. The name of Jack Knebel isn't a household word. He's a city boy from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He told a congressional committee last year he never intended agriculture as a career and he never studied agriculture in college. He spent a couple of years as a junior lawyer on the staff of the House of Representatives and then a couple of more in the Small Business Administration. He went over to the Agricultural Department a little over three years ago, just in time to help them justify their efforts to kill the REA program, water and sewer grants, the ACP program, and a handful more. And early last year, he quit and went into private practice until Butts handpicked him late last year to come back as the number two man in the Department of Agriculture. Another example of insensitivity to farmers, but there are more. They're completely insensitive when the bottom falls out of the cattle market due in large measure to their own mismanagement of the economy, disastrous price ceiling on red meat, and when your senators and congressmen take the lead on emergency loan programs to help keep feeders and ranchers in business, they oppose them at every step of the way. When your senators and congressmen 
and a few from the other party as well, tried to provide some protection against PACA bankruptcy. The White House threatens a veto. When beef imports reach a record high level, as they have under this administration, they continue to suspend the import quotas provided by law. Just over the weekend, the president, he did take some steps in that direction, and I'm real happy. Jimmy Carter has been urging him to do this for weeks, and I'm happy to see that he's finally moved in, in that direction, but I'm afraid it's a case of too little and too late. But there's a pattern in all of this, a pattern of insensitivity, and they're insensitive to the needs for predictability, the need to stop the wild fluctuations which drive us to distractions. When we promise to inject a little more predictability into commodity markets, they accuse us of government manipulation. They even try to tell us that instability is good for the American farmer. They say depression level prices are all right as long as we have some good years too. They say what's important is the average. As long as we make a little some years, we can afford to lose a lot in other years. And that reminds me of the old story about averages. The fella had one foot frozen in a block of ice and the other foot in a kettle of boiling water. His average temperature was normal. <laughs> one thing they're usually sensitive about, how the wind blows in election years. Secretary Butts, or I should say the former secretary, left to say that he was not above spending money like a drunken sailor to buy the farm vote in 1972. A couple of weeks ago, it looked like it was time to lock up the liquor cabinet because they were off on another classic binge. Within a few days' time, they announced early food for, pe early food for peace purchases of wheat and rice to show up the market, and that didn't work. So they announced they were buying a lot of beef for school lunch programs, but that didn't work because they never bought much beef. Then they announced they would fund ACP at the full level appropriated by Congress and said some nice things about former elected committees. That must have come as a surprise to the folks in the county offices and to the committeemen who have become used to being insulted by frick and butts on alternating weeks. But I'm beginning to wonder if they even have much political sensitivity left. The other day, the fellow who heads Farmers for Ford, a former assistant secretary, a former lobbyist for the big meat packers, said he wasn't too worried that farm prices had declined in four out of the last seven months. Frankly, I worry when the price of wheat is under 50% of parity, even if it's not an election year. But the Ford people think differently. They keep talking about net farm income, but have to concede that there are a few soft spots. Now let's look at the spots to see if we can find where the softness is. Starting with the Ford campaign list, we come up with beef cattle, hogs, sugar beets, potatoes, and dry beans. They forgot to add wheat. But it's easy to add to that list those commodities that have been soft spots at least once or twice in the last four years. Cattle prices have been a losing proposition for nearly all of the time. Milk prices bankrupt a lot of dairy farmers after Nicks and Butts opened the floodgates to imported cheese in 1973. Soybean farmers were frightened by sharp drops early this year before the market firmed back up, and they were unsettled as well by a sharp increase in palm oil imports. Cotton farmers are doing pretty well today. But 70 cent cotton hasn't erased my memory of 25 cent cotton just a couple of years back. And it causes jitters about 25 cent cotton a year or two from now because when the roller coaster goes up, you know full well it's going to come down just as fast or faster. And that pretty well covers all commodities, soft spots all the way around. And if I can read political winds, Economic troubles in farming means it's time for a new direction and a new team. And that's why I feel optimistic about the outcome of next month's election. I feel optimistic for Jimmy Carter 
But most of all, I feel optimistic for the future of this country. I feel optimistic because voters are beginning to sense a clear difference between the candidates. There's a real difference between the uncertainty and high risk of four more years with Ford and the greater predictability that Jimmy Carter can bring to agriculture. There's a real difference between the cozy deals between USDA and the green trade under Nixon, Ford, and Butts, and the integrity that Jimmy Carter will restore to government. There's a sharp difference between the freedom to go broke that farmers have under this administration and the freedom to produce with realistic price protection that you will have under a Carter administration. The difference is sharpest of all between an administration that gives you four embargoes in three years and the hope of a new administration that recognizes the importance of your export markets and the valuable contribution that American farmers have made to American economic recovery. Farming and ranching is not child's play. It's one of the most risky, most fragile enterprises known to the human mind. It's tough enough having to contend with drought or flood or green bugs without having to fight off the federal government at the same time. Farmers can't stand much more of this hit or miss, head in the sand, crisis to crisis mentality that has given us no policy at all in the most turbulent years in the history of American agriculture. Jimmy Carter understands your problems because he's faced them firsthand. He may grow peanuts and I may grow cotton, but we're the same kind of folks as those who grow wheat and oats out here in the Great Plains. Jimmy Carter knows firsthand the hard work, the high cost, and sound business management that it takes to farm. He knows firsthand what it takes to meet a payroll, what it takes to raise the capital for a small business enterprise. As a former governor, he knows firsthand the need for a government to operate more smoothly, to be understandable to our people, the critical need to plan ahead and solve problems before they happen. And he's a family man, a church leader, a man who knows that the strength of our country is no more than that of its smallest units, the small towns and the communities of rural America. He understands that the moral fiber of America likewise can be no stronger than the example our leaders give us. That's why, in the final analysis, it's time in agriculture and throughout America for a real change. It's time for Jimmy Carter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bobby Smith, for being with us, and we'll have some questions for you in just a, a few moments. Senator McGovern couldn't be with us today. He's on uh, another important uh, assignment. And any senator to be a success in serving his constituents well has to put together a, a good staff. There's just no question about that. And I think that in Senator McGovern's case, he has surrounded himself with some very able men that I've worked with and admire greatly, and people like George Cunningham, who many of you know, John Holden, who was a farm boy originally from Groton, and of course, Owen Donnelly who is an attorney and works uh, for the senator for, for many years. And Owen is here with us today, and since his little girl didn't have school today, she came out in the jet with him. Uh, Shannon Donnelly is here somewhere. I don't just see her at the moment, but we're happy that she could come along with her father and spend the day out here in South Dakota with us. I just want to say this about Owen before he speaks. This summer, uh, Secretary Duxbury and your President Ben Radcliffe and myself uh, had the opportunity of testifying before a subcommittee of the United States Senate Agricultural Committee describing drought conditions out here. And it was Owen Donnelly that made that uh, appearance uh, comfortable and made us feel at ease and I think helped us make that testimony effective. And we're happy to have you out here, Owen, to share what's uh, on your mind talking about delivering services to South Dakota, and of course the greetings from the Senator too. Go ahead. Owen Donnelly. Thank you very much, Governor Wallman. I did bring along, I think, the youngest 
Farmers Union booster in the audience, my daughter Shannon, she's a freshman in high school this year, and she was very happy to accompany me out here. I can see the clock ticking away, and I want to save as much time as I possibly can for uh, questions from the audience, because I'm sure there are going to be a lot of them. I'm going to hold my remarks at a very brief minimum. Uh, I have one announcement to make. I called the White House this morning, and I found that the President on Saturday night signed the $50 hay transportation subsidy bill. Uh, we'd worked very, very hard, very, very diligently on that bill. Uh, he had until midnight Saturday to sign the bill. We've been keeping track of it by calling the White House every day. Uh, and I called this morning. And he did sign the $50 hay transportation subsidy bill, the maximum not to exceed $50. It's 80% of the cost of the transporting the hay now not to exceed $50 a ton. That is up from 63, 66 and two-thirds cents not to exceed $27 a ton. So after a lot of fight and after a lot of struggle, we did get something just this morning, and I'm happy to let you folks know about it. The second announcement I have to make is a very important event to us, which is taking place on October 13th, 1976, in Sioux Falls at the Downtown Holiday Inn. This is South Dakota's Water Policy Conference, sponsored by Senator George McGovern. Uh, our representative, Bob Musselman, is in the hall. Uh, it will be one of the most, one of the landmark conservation and water conferences uh, probably to determine what's going on in South Dakota in the next decade. And uh, if Bob Musselman would stand up, I'd like to have you people get a look at him because he's taking reservations and he can let you, he can answer any questions uh, you might have about the conference. Is Bob Musselman in the hall? Back in the stand up way in the corner. He's not very hard to see. Members of the Farmers Union, uh, I have a letter dated a few days ago to Ben Radcliffe from Senator George McGovern, which I would like to read to you, and then I won't take up any more of your time. Dear Ben, I'm sorry that I will not be able to be with you in Huron next week for the South Dakota Farmers Union Annual Convention. I do hope, however, that you will convey my personal greetings and appreciations to your membership. Through your leadership, the South Dakota Farmers Union has continued its historic representation of the family farmer and rancher. Your concerns have manifest themselves in progressive legislation at the state and federal level. The voice of the Farmers Union is respected and heeded in Pierre and Washington because those of us with public responsibilities know that you speak for the best interests of rural America. With a new Congress and an elected president coming into office next January, the challenge to farmers will be direct and immediate as we face the opportunity to enact sound, realistic, and responsive legislation through the vehicle of the 1977 Farm Bill. As I have done in the past, I will continue to look to the South Dakota Farmers Union for your suggestions and recommendations on the structure of this important legislation. The devastating drought in South Dakota this year underscores again the need to proceed with realistic water development, to put water on the land where it is needed and in the amounts required. I know the Farmers Union shares my interests in ensuring this, that this is accomplished in a way that will benefit the individual family farmer to the maximum extent possible. I am proud to be a friend of the South Dakota Farmers Union. I salute your members for what they have accomplished 
for the good work you are doing and for your continuing progressive efforts in the future. I welcome the opportunity to work with you and for you on the challenges ahead. With kind personal regards, I am sincerely yours, Senator George McGovern. If I may take one minute, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in closing, I would like to uh, dwell on some legislative accomplishments in the last session of the con in, in the last session of the Congress. Senator McGovern, on July 21, on July 1, convened his subcommittee on agricultural credit into emergency session to examine the effectiveness of the entire disaster program. Witnesses included Senator Humphrey, Lieutenant Governor Woolman, uh, your friend and mine, Ben Radcliffe, Bob Duxbury, the Secretary of State of South Dakota, Senator James Aberask, as well as witnesses from Minnesota. The result of these hearings was a commitment to entirely rewrite the disaster program in the 1977 Farm Act. These hearings also set the stage for three important legislative maneuvers to come later in the session targeted specifically at South Dakota farmers. The first of these, amendment, of these measures was the McGovern Amendment to the Tax Reform Act of 1976 involving livestock sold on account of drought. This amendment, this amendment, this amendment, this amendment, this amendment, this amendment, this amendment